Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you very much. What a privilege. What an honor. And what a great blessing it has been these past days to sit and rest in the arms of Jesus. We have seen miracles. We have had a wonderful Holy Spirit filled experience in prayer. We have understood greater and deeper things. You have pointed out many sins and have given us victory in many areas. I thank you for those who sit here this afternoon having forsaken the things of this world so that they could embrace Jesus. And now, O oh Lord, this afternoon as we commit, dedicate, and give life over for your control and for your pleasure, we plead, Lord, that you may do in us what we cannot do of ourselves. Oh, Father, we plead for you to speak to us. For if I speak, we all will just be led astray. Please, mighty Father, where I have failed and fallen short, please, may you move in, take control, allow your Holy Spirit to possess hearts and minds. And allow everybody here this afternoon to be changed, transformed, and delivered by God completely for your glory, O oh Father, not for ours. Please speak to us now, dear Lord. Empty us now of self and unrighteousness. And please, please baptize us in your Holy Spirit. That we may go from here changed, transformed, forever dedicated to the world. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. I praise God for the testimonies you have shared in witnessing and in sharing Jesus. And I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you in having a much more deeper and more fruitful experience with the Lord. I will work my way slowly through this message and I will pray that you may pray with me that the Lord will help us see deeper, brighter, and better things for the glory of God. I want to begin where everyone has stopped, should I say. I want to take off or bring this to a pause, or bring this to a summation and fullness as we bring all of that which we have heard, whether in your breakout sessions, whether you've heard that in the sessions here or the morning devotions or the evening devotions. It is my prayer that we bring it all together and see how we can be better used and why we need to engage much more deeply and more intimately into the service of the Lord. I was very amazed when the theme for the event was picked. The name of the theme was Enamor. And as I looked at it, while my mind was still centering around Enamor, trying to figure that out, I was then hit with a lower caption that says, Spicing up the soul. And I praise God for that which each and every one of you have learned in the different breakout sessions of how you can have a much more fruitful and a more meaningful relationship with the Lord. I want to take some time looking at this word again. The word enamor, of course, comes from the word amor. Are you able to see that? Enamor comes from the word amor, which means love. And then we have the Latin prefix en, en. And we use that in many ways, for many words. So if something is covered, we say that it is encapsulated. So it is a capsule, but when it is covered, we call it, it is covered with something, so it is encapsulated. If it is a circle, and you go around in a circle, you have just encircled the place. And if somebody has a title, we say this is entitled. And so 
we leave the word by itself, but when we add the prefix en, we are causing something to happen in this place. And Pastor Henry had really brought out the beauty of the word as he talked about us being enamored with Christ. Us being filled, in other words, if, if amor means love, we are filled then with love, but he emphasized because many of us are filled with love, or should I say, stuff we call love. We are filled with many kinds of so-called loves, love for this and love for that, love for friends and love for things in life or materials in life. So it was important that the evening devotion that night began with centering the theme or understanding we are not just wanting ourselves to be enamored because the truth is all of us are enamored one way or the other. Whether you realize it or not, all of us are enamored. Maybe before you came to this youth conference, you were enamored by movies and games. And after listening to Brother Faith and the Holy Spirit using him mightily, you are still enamored, but now you're enamored with Christ. Here's the thing. The Lord does not want to block your love. The Lord does not want to stop you from being enamored. He just wants you to be enamored with the right things. Many say the serving Christ is boring. It's not fun. It's, it's not exciting. If that's what you say, you still have not experienced true ministry. Because I have experienced the greatest joys of life and I have known no greater joy than to just serve the Lord. Some say, no, but if I come to Christ, I'll have to stop hungering for this and that. The Lord does not want to take away your hunger. He just wants you to hunger for the right things. He does not want to take away your thirst. I am amazed when I look at the life of Paul. He was filled with zeal. And we're going to take a look at that text in a while. Uh, Philippians 3, he was introducing himself. And in verse 6, I believe he says that he was persecuting people with zeal. And Christ did not take away the zeal. He says, I'll keep the zeal. I'll just channel the zeal in the right direction. And so we have all come with some enamoring experience of life. Enamored by this or that. And I praise God that we sit here this afternoon. Still enamored, but now enamored with that which matters more. So I talk about this word for a while. Because... It is to cause to be filled. One is enamored by something. One cannot just be enamored by the mist of the air. There is a subject that enamors oneself. So something causes you to be enamored. Whether it was your fashion, whether whatever you liked before you got here, something has caused you to be filled with love. Now the Bible really actually defines and explains to us <clears throat> what true enamoring should look like and what it really biblically means to be filled with love. Now, when we turn to the Bible is where we really find the fullness of the experience of being filled with love. Many of us have looked into our lives and I don't think there's anyone here who said I will just, oh no, church is not for me, or this and that. Most of us came here through a church experience. The majority of us came here through a church experience. So we were in church, attending, maybe sometimes, oh, the sermon is boring, this or that, but we attend church, every once in a while you read your Bible, and you pray, it's not like you're strange to prayer. So you've prayed, you've read your Bible, and you've gone to church, and maybe would have attended a youth camp or a spiritual retreat. But find yourself in that circle of life which just entraps you in you going back and forth. Every Sabbath you are a great person and the rest of the six days you find yourself throwing back into life. Uh, Saturday nights are some of the worst nights. Saturday nights can sometimes become the worst nights uh, for a Christian because a Sabbath morning you're enjoying an amen and you stand for appeals and maybe you're even crying and coming to the front. And when the sun sets, so does your appeal set. 
When the sun sets, so does your desire and your enamor for Christ settle as well. And very quickly, <clears throat> most of the movie marathons take place Saturday night. Are you still there? Okay. Many gaming marathons and, and shopping marathons, they, they, all these things take place during Saturday night. Even in the world, it's a, it's a popular night, Saturday night. And so we find ourselves coming to church, obviously wanting to love Christ. Wanting to draw close to Him, wanting to be one with Him. Uh, and it's easier done on a Sabbath day, but once that is over and I'm back to school or college or work, you find yourself again in that circle where you're again caught up in the stuff of the world until Friday evening reminds you of Sabbath. What amazes me is this. Many people will go through a week of entertainment and fun and joy in the world and on um, Friday when the sun begins to set. On Friday when Sunday you say, oh, the sun is about to set. And immediately when the sun sets, you turn off you know, the internet maybe or the television or you turn off your movie screens or you take off your secular music. And when everything turns off on a Saturday night and you put all of that away, people begin to think, now that I've put all of this away, now I'm keeping the Sabbath day holy. And many, in fact, begin to think, now that I've put all of this aside, I'm ready to have wings come out my back, I've become an angel. Because I've put all these things off, I've turned everything off, and now I'm getting ready, I'm ready now to have an experience with Christ. Experience will have proved to you, if you've not walked with Jesus during the week, you'll have a hard time walking with Him on the Sabbath day. Most of us don't realize the words of Christ. Jesus says, God says in Exodus 20, as He gives the commands, He says in the fourth commandment, how does it go? Remember the Sabbath day to do what? To what? To keep it holy. Now, our problem is, listen to me carefully, our problem is we begin to think, hey, when Sabbath comes, all I need to do is turn this off, that off, and so if I'm not watching television, I'm not listening to secular music, uh, now I'm, I'm really good, I'm just, I'm just keeping the day holy. Our problem is we begin to think, when we turn this off, that's when this day is holy. Are you still there? When we turn all the secular stuff off and turn our attention to the world, that's when the day becomes holy. We forget. God did not say, remember the Sabbath day to make it holy. Is that what he said? That's not what he said. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Because in Genesis 2, he already made the Sabbath day holy. Are we still together? He already created it, sanctified it, hallowed it, set it apart. And he says, I have already made it holy. I don't expect you to make it holy because you cannot make it holy. I'm expecting you to keep it holy. The word keep means to maintain. Are you still there? The word keep means to maintain. If I, if Howard, my friend, has a car, and I say, Howard, I want to borrow your car, and I take his car out, Howard says, I'll let you have it, but make sure you keep the gas level where it is when I gave you. So if it's at half gas tank, I hope you keep it at that level when you return it back to me. So I am to maintain what I am given. If he gives me the color of the car when he gave it to me, the color of the car was black, I am not allowed to return it to the pink. Are you still there? Because when I return to him, he's going to ask me, hey, this is not your car, it's my car. I made it black. Who allowed you to paint it pink? So God is asking on the Sabbath day not for you to make the Sabbath day holy because it is already holy. He expects us to maintain the holiness of the Sabbath day. So what we do, act, think, and everything that circles around that experience is our maintaining the holiness. The problem there is, my friends, if we have not spent time with God in the week, if we have not spent more and more hours with God, centering ourselves in a holy experience with the Lord, it, keeping the Sabbath day becomes a burden. And we find it challenging, we find it hard to do because it seems like it is a burden. 
And it does feel like it's a burden if one has not really spent that time, has not had that experience, that intimacy with the Lord during the week. As we bring all of this to a close, how can enamor be fully, truly, in its truest definition, be explained? Because the root word of enamor is love. And that's what really makes the difference. So we find ourselves many times burdened. Can't wait. Many people just can't wait for sun to set on the Sabbath day because I want to go back to my everyday, weekly, secular life. So the Lord gives us a break. He gives us a solution. He, the Lord actually teaches us what it means to be enamored. And one pastor, Pastor, pastor Levin, Pastor Wayne Levin, puts it this way. He explains the beauty of, 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 of being enamored. For instance, uh, go to 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4 and verse 8. 1 John 4, 8. Are you there? We will go 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Is everyone there? Is anyone there? Okay, there is someone there. How does it go? He that... No one is there. What does the text say? First John word. He that loveth not, knoweth not God because God is. Okay, so the Bible says it is God who is love. In other words, friends, love in the Bible is not a feeling. Are you still awake? Love in the Bible is not a feeling. God is love. So for, for me to have love, who do I need to have? God. And when I do not have God who is love, I do not know what love is. Does that make sense? So I cannot say to someone, I love you, but in my own life, I have no time for God. Uh, in a relationship where we're telling each other, I love you, but in that relationship, God is not the center and the foundation, then that relationship is not founded and based upon love. Why again? Because God is love. Now, 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 pay attention. We're struggling to, to, to understand how can we really have that. So somebody asked a question last night, what do you do when one's faith is dead? Uh, go with me to John 14. Uh, the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus. John 14. The book of John chapter 14. John 14 and verse 15. John 14, 15. Jesus says what? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Okay. Immediately when you look at that text, you begin to think, ah, oh. he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, but I've not been keeping his commandments. That means I don't love him. Does that make sense? I've not been, I've been breaking this command, I've been breaking that, I've been doing this bad thing, I've been doing that bad thing. I, I don't think I really love God. I say I love God, but I've been breaking His commandments over and over again. I, I really don't think I love God. And so you pass that judgment and many, many are scared. Hey, to love God, I really need to keep the commandments. So many have shunned away the law of God because they're scared, because they feel that. It seems like God is asking for too much for me to be keeping all the commandments, for me to prove to him that I love him. The problem is that's the understanding we've been depicting from the passage. Whereas Jesus is not challenging you. He's not challenging you to tell you, hey, I want to check how much you love me. Keep my commandments. You failed here, see, you don't love me. If the Bible says, who is love? Who is love? God is love. And in John 14, 15, Jesus is saying, if you what? Love me. But who is love? And if you have invited God in your life, then when God comes, he also brings what with him? Because God is. Because so when God comes, he brings love also with him. If I have God, I have love. Then Jesus is saying, if you have God already in your life, then keeping the commandments is automatic. Are you still there? Yes. Many of us are struggling. Why? Because we're trying to keep the commandments. We're trying to be good. We're trying to be nice. And we're trying to be this. And we're trying to come to church. And we're trying to... The thing is, 
is you're trying a lot. But at the end of the day, you get really tired. I give my friends this example. I, want, I, I asked them quite a few times, I said, okay, how many of you ate ice cream over a month ago? Raise your hands. So let me try that question here. How many of you ate ice cream over? Some of you cannot raise your hands because that's how you eating ice cream a while ago. Okay. So, how many of you ate ice cream a month ago? Can I see your hands? It's been over a month since you ate ice cream. So, oh, few. Wow. Okay. But let me ask this one. Everybody knows it's not really healthy for you, right? Everybody knows, right? Now, it's not something new, okay? But, but catch this. Maybe you attend a health seminar. And in the health lecture, you are presented all these truths and you're told, hey, uh, you need to be able to keep the body healthy, the body, the temple of God, and we go through all these texts. And so you go to, okay, okay, i got to take stuff out that I don't like. So what do you start with? Okay, I, I've been eating a lot of ice cream. It's not good for me. So let me keep ice cream out of my diet. So what do you do? You start avoiding ice cream. So you keep ice cream aside. Okay, if it's in my fridge, uh, some, will, some will say, I'm just going to throw it in the trash. Others say, mm, this la let me just finish this one. And then I will not eat it anymore. And so you eat it off or you throw it in the trash, whatever you do. After that, you start avoiding. Okay, so I'm not going to buy ice cream. So you don't buy ice cream. And you avoid, avoid, avoid. You're successful for a week, a month, uh, maybe a year. And then comes Christmas time. And you're walking on the road and this huge billboard. It says during Christmas time they have three flavors in one. And it's a huge box of ice cream in that billboard. And you see a person with a spoon. And the spoon is like the scraping of the ice cream. And he puts it in his mouth. You can see it in his mouth and this facial expression. Some of you are already mouth watering, so I will not go further than that. <laughs> but whenever you see that, you're like, oh no. I cannot eat ice cream, but I want to, I really want it. So you try, maybe you will go hard, okay, I will still not eat it. But then you see another girl, but you still want it. And you look at it, but you still want it. But inside you know it's not good, but you still want it. And someday or the other you do break. You are still there? Maybe some have been successful in avoiding, and they've avoided for so long, they've, been, they've become experts in avoiding, but here's the thing. No matter how much you avoid it, you still love ice cream. Yes or no? Yes. We think sin is like ice cream. If I can just avoid it, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it, I will be fine. And because I've avoided so much sin, now I've become righteous. Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells me that righteousness is not described merely by the absence of sin. Are you still with me? Righteousness in the Bible is not described by merely the absence of sin. Righteousness in the Bible is described by the presence of Jesus. The thing with what we're studying is God wants to enter your heart. He says, I am love. When I come, I will bring love with me. And when I am in you, you will automatically keep the commandments. Friends, if you allow Christ in your life, the one who is actually love, let me tell you this, only then for the first time in your life, you will know what it feels to be enamored. Because the word is amor, because the word is love, you still don't know what it feels to be enamored unless you're filled with the one who is amor, and that's only God. So when, when you allow God to come in your lives, he says, then you will automatically keep the commandments. Christ in you, Paul says, is your hope of glory. Christ in you is able to enable you to keep the commandments. But it gets sweeter than that. Pay attention. Pastor Dan Pastor says this. It blew my mind off. He says, when we read the Ten Commandments, we're reading it as a list of rules. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. So don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. He says, when we read it, we like to read it as ten rules and regulations. But catch this, if you allow Christ to come in your life, if that love is in you, you're able to keep the commandments, then listen to me, they don't no longer remain ten commandments. The ten commandments become ten promises. Are you still there? 
The Ten Commandments change their shape. They actually don't become ten rules and regulations. They become ten promises. You know why? If you allow Christ to come in you and He has taken possession of your life, you've been pleading with Him at united prayers, at prayer sessions, in your personal prayer with God. You've been pleading with Him to come into your heart. When He comes in your heart, as John 14, 15 says, if you have love, you'll be able to keep my commandments. When Jesus enters your heart, you are no longer forced or pushed to keep the commandments. When Jesus enters your heart, He turns the Ten Commandments into promises. Listen to me carefully. The commandments don't sound anymore like, hey, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. So it's not, oh, so much things are not to do. When you allow Christ in your life, then the Ten Commandments are promises that if you have Christ, you will not steal. If you have Jesus, you will not commit adultery. If you have Jesus, you will have no other gods before him. If you have Jesus, you will remember to keep the Sabbath day. Friends, Today, God is not wanting you to act nice. He's not wanting you to act righteous. He's not asking you to act holy. He's only asking you to let Christ enter your life. If He can enter your life, the stuff you're struggling to overcome, and the stuff I guarantee you, you will never be able to overcome, Christ in you is able, friends, Christ in you does not just take away you wanting and he does not help you avoid sin. Christ in you changes your desires. Christ in you alters even your desire. So he, he no longer wants you to avoid sin. He changes the desire you have towards sin. And the Bible tells us he wants to create in us that hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. That's primarily the foundation of what we're really talking about as we draw all of this to a close. I want us all to go and understand just a few things as we begin to bring this passage to a, to a close. If you have your Bibles, turn your Bibles with me to the book of Luke chapter 5. The book of Luke chapter 5. I saw that during the appeal made for people who want to go out and for people who want to share, for people who want to lead out, people who want to form more small groups, want to do evangelistic work, who want to go out and win people for the Lord. I saw almost everybody stand. And we've been talking about training sessions that can be given to be able to equip us and to better us. I want us to go through a quick story and draw out some deep lessons that we all can use. First of all, which is why we begin this progressive journey. First of all, God is really not calling us to do things. Are you listening to me? God is really not calling any of us really to do things. Hey, I want you to go do this and do that. He is not calling us to do things. He's asking us to become something. Ministry is not about me going, doing something. Ministry is me about, it's about me becoming someone in the process of doing the ministry. It is you that God is appealing to, you that God really wants to change in the process of mission work. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Luke chapter 5 as we study the Bible together. Yeah, the passage is Luke chapter 5 as we take a look at a very interesting story you all know very, very well. You know the story so well. So we're just going to study this passage and be able to see something deeper for us to understand. Luke 5 verse 1. Is everyone there? Okay. The Bible says, It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. This is the story. Let's read through the story and let's try to break it apart after that. So the story is about Jesus standing by the lake. Verse 2, two ships were standing by the lake, the fishermen were gone out of them, they were washing their nets, they entered into one of the, and Jesus entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed to him, can you thrust out a little from the land? He sat down, and then he began to teach the people, the Bible says, out of the ship. Verse 4, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch into the deep, and let down your nets. So Simon is there. 
he asked Simon to push his boat further into, asked Simon to push his ship further into the, uh, to the water body. He gets there, he sits inside, and he begins to teach from the ship. But the Bible says in verse 4, that Jesus says now, after he was done speaking, he says to Simon in verse 4, now launch into the deep and let down your net. Simon, now move further away from the narrow water or the shallow water rather of, of, of the shore. Now move into the deeper area. Put down your net. Verse 5. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night. We have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. We know the story very well. Verse 6. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Interesting story. When they went down, which God was asking them to do, Simon began to gather fish and it was so much fish that the net was breaking. Did you catch that? Now, I'm, I'm sure Brother Faith will have touched it uh, along the point of his discussion. So, Today the problem is many of even the biblical movies presented out there, they struggle presenting the truth of the word. I, I watched one and the, the, this scene was depicted so wrongly, it was, it, was, it was completely against the word of God. It shows that it was only Simon and he got a lot of ship and he sat there and he was in amazement looking at Jesus. That, and that's how the scene was depicted. But the Bible says in, in, in the story, he says when he heard and obeyed God, he had so many fishes, nets were breaking as so heavy he was, verse 7. They beckoned unto their partners. So Simon was calling his partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, that both the ships began to sink. There was so much fish in the ship that both the ships were sinking. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. Let's pause there. And let's go over the story again. And I hope I, you are still awake with me. Because I want us to learn just four things from this beautiful story. Four very important things from this beautiful story. See... Luke 5 begins by Jesus asking Simon, Simon, take this boat, push it further, and let's go into the sea. And Jesus, there's a whole group of people who want to listen to Jesus. But Jesus moves away from them and goes very far away into the sea. And from there he begins to teach them. Somebody asks the question, if Jesus really wanted to teach them, why didn't he stand in the midst? Why didn't he go up, you know, some pulpit or some stage and from a higher ground he would have been able to see them and, and talk to them? Why did he have to move away from them? Why didn't he be close to them? And he sits in the ship and he says, now from the ship I will talk to the people. Now friends, I really need you to think with me, okay? For those of you who attended the discussion on Bible study, we were doing the Bible study now, so pay attention. Here is someone told by Jesus, let's go further away from the people in the ship and from there I will teach. One asks, why did he have to go away from the people and then sit in the ship and teach? Because friends, listen carefully. The whole passage of Luke 5, Jesus, while talking to the people, the main emphasis of Jesus is Simon. It is Simon who he really wants to win. It is Simon who he wants to win as a disciple. And if you just catch the beauty of this, you will find yourself quite amazed. So listen to the story. He says, let's go out. And from your ship, I, after he asked him to go out, Jesus sits down. And then he begins to teach. And Simon is shocked. He's like, what? Because every time Simon, who is a fisherman, every time he moves into the ship and goes away from the shore, Simon knows, I am now going to catch fish. Jesus says, just move away. Simon thinks we're going fishing, but Jesus sits down and begins to teach. And Simon's like, wait a second, I thought we were going fishing. Because each time Simon gets into the ship, he only knows that he's going fishing. Jesus takes a boat, a ship that is used for fishing, and he turns the ship into a tool for evangelism. Are you still there? Jesus takes an ordinary ship 
which Simon used every day and he associated with the ship every day, looking at the ship as a means of resource, as a means of buying and getting food and subsistence for himself. That's how he got things to be able to keep the business going to have food. Jesus keeps all of that aside and he says, Simon, forget about fish today. I'm going to teach you not just to catch fish. I will still use your same boat. I will still use your same ship. I will use your same talent. And I'm going to teach you how to fish men. Friends, there are many people, even right here, who are saying, hey, but I don't preach, hey, but I don't sing, hey, but I don't do this and I don't do that. And they're saying, no, but I kill, I, I'm only doing this and I'm only doing that. And the Lord is saying, whatever talent the Lord has given you today, that talent is not for your glory. That talent is for the usefulness of God. Because ministry, my friends, is not about your convenience. Ministry is about your usefulness. And if in this people region you want to be a blessing to others, you have to get ready to be useful. So whatever talent you have, the Lord is saying you might look at that talent to use it for a certain purpose. Maybe you are a nurse and you always think whenever I wear my nurse's uniform, I am only going to go check blood pressure to give meds and I'm going to go, that's my job. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to use your ship. I'm going to use your profession. I'm going to use the talent I've given you and I'm going to use it and teach you that that talent is given to you for the glory of God. Now, draw further into this. Verse 3 says this. Jesus entered into one of Simon's ship, which was Simon's, and he prayed that he would thrust down a little from the land. He sat down, taught the people. After he was done speaking, verse 4, he says, Simon, launch into the deep and let down your nets. He says to Simon, Simon, now move away from the shallow waters, the not so deep waters. Simon, move into the deep waters. In the deep waters, I want you to put down the net. When he did so, he caught a great multitude of fish. Brothers and sisters, you need to understand what Jesus is trying to teach Simon. Simon, if you want to catch fish, you have to move away from the shore. You want to catch fish, you have to move away from shallow waters. Friends, many here seated are saying, we want great miracles. We want people to be changed and converted and to accept Christ. That is not going to happen if you are going to allow only these shallow experiences to become your life experiences. Are you still there? If you're going to stay at the shore, let's just be comfortable. Let's just come next year also to St. Helena or just go to knock on you and that's all we have to do. Friends, unless, like Jesus says, unless you're willing to go into the deep end, Unless you're going to go into the deep waters, you are not going to catch anything in life. You're not going to win any souls for the glory of God unless we learn to move away from the shore, move away from the comfort, move away from the luxury, move away into the deepness to be able to experience the work of God. But he moves further. Simon answering in verse 5 says to him, Master, we have toiled all night, we have caught nothing. And I've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let it down. Now, he obeys. And when he obeys, great miracles happen. Jesus, in the process, is teaching Simon not just how to catch fish. He's teaching Simon how important it is to catch people. How important it is to bring people to the understanding of God. The thing is that Simon was not a preacher. Simon did not sit in the seminary. Simon did not go to the school of theology. Simon was not a pastor, but Simon was used by God in the profession he was already in to be a minister for Christ and to bring people to accept Jesus, to bring people to draw closer to Jesus. I want you to take a look at something very simple, but something very deep. This story teaches us four important lessons on what we need today. This can be your training seminar. At the same time, this can be 
uh, final charge to you as you go out. This is what we need at, at PYC Biko to really turn things around. So now listen to this. You've been listening to be enamored with Christ. You've been listening to put away the past and look forward to Jesus. This morning you heard a powerful presentation about our need of the Holy Spirit to get this work finished. I want us to pay attention now. Now that you've pleaded for Christ, now that you've received Christ like Simon, what do we need to do now to gain the beautiful success in the work that God wants to give to us? If you have your Bibles then, you are with me in Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. Luke 5 and verse 1 in your Bibles. Luke 5 verse 1. The Bible says it came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. Luke 5 says a whole crowd, they were pressing upon Jesus. And the Bible says they were pressing upon him only to hear the word of God. If you read Isaiah 53, Isaiah says the Messiah had no form or comeliness to him. In other words, he was describing Jesus and he was saying that Jesus is not your tall, dark and handsome man. He was not the man you'd be attracted to because of his physical beauty. There is no form or comeliness to him, Isaiah says. So here were the people attracted to him in Luke 5 verse 1, but the Bible says they were attracted to him because they were pressing upon him to hear the word of God. Brothers and sisters, listen to me very carefully. You can have the best presentations. You can have the best preparation for PYC. You can have the best things in life, the best equipment, unless you have the word of God to share. Nobody is interested. You can try the gimmicks, you can try the presentations, you can try the banners, you can try flyers, unless you have the solid word of God. There is nobody who is going to accept Jesus as their personal savior. Those who seek to win people for God, they, like Jesus, are spending time in the word of God. A study of the word and people drawing near only to hear the word of God. Friends, the thing is, Many times we've become like any other faith faith establishment. We discuss this and we discuss that and we discuss this idea and that doctrine and we end the whole message with one or two verses. Let me say this to you. When our church first began, listen to me carefully. When our church first began, this might shock you. When our church first began, a preacher could get up and in one sermon, he could quote up to 97 Verses. Did you hear me? No. One preacher could get up in the early years of our Adventist church. One preacher would get up and in one sermon he would quote 97 verses. And he would get through it quickly because the church was studying the Bible also. Today it takes us five verses and it's hard to finish them and wrap them up in one hour because you have to explain. And, and, and so many times we find ourselves lost. The congregation is lost because the studying of the Bible is expected only from the preacher, not from the congregation. And friends, most of what we know today about God, we've only learned from preachers, not from our personal study. And that is sad. Jesus says, you want people to come. You want people to be changed. You want this region to be transformed. You, like Jesus, need the word of God to be changed. The first quality, the first characteristic of those people seeking to bring others to the Lord have to have the word of God and need to learn how to teach and share the word of God. Let's take a look at number two. The second quality is my personal favorite. Simon in Luke 5 and verse 5. Simon answering unto him said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Simon sounds like many of us here. Are you there in the back? Simon sounds like many of us seated here under this roof who are told to go out and reach out. So we try to pull someone in. We try to encourage a friend. We try to encourage a family member who's not in the faith. And we try, try, try and they reject. They always neglect. They always put us off. So we've decided, hey, this thing doesn't work. I've tried reaching out to that person. 
I've tried reaching out to that barangay. I've tried reaching out to that family. And they don't accept Christ. And like Simon, we tell Jesus, Jesus, I have toiled all night. There is nothing there. I've worked hard. I've prayed for them, Lord. I've even fasted for them, Lord. I've even had Bible studies with them, but they, they, they don't. They, they're hopeless. We a lot of times sound like Simon. Lord, I've told all right, I've caught nothing. But, but notice what Simon does at the end of the verse. He says, nevertheless, Lord, I have thy will. I will let down the net. He says, in my heart, I don't know if it's really going to work, but I'm going to do it anyhow because Jesus, you asked me to do it. Verse 6, pay attention. This is going to get interesting. When they had this done, they closed a great multitude of fish and their net break. Okay, verse 7. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. They were beckoning the other partners to come and help them. And when they, the others came, they, they both caught ship, they, uh, they both caught fish. And the Bible says in verse 7, they came, they filled both the ships, and they began to sing. Friends, listen to me first of all, carefully. Each shipping vessel in Galilean times, are you still there? Each shipping vessel in Galilean times would weigh close to two tons. How many tons? Two tons. Every shipping vessel would weigh around two tons. And do you firstly imagine how much fish it would take to sink a two-ton ship? Are you thinking with me? How much fish do you really need to catch that it can be so weighty that it can sink a two-ton ship? Secondly, Secondly, they, it was not only Simon's ship, they are called friends also. So there were two ships or more. And they were filling up these ships and it was so much fish that all these boats, they were filled to the brim and all of them were sinking. Can you imagine how much fish they would have caught to sink two ton ships one after the other? But pay attention, pay attention. If Simon is there and he's given up on something, it doesn't work. But Lord, if you're saying, I'm going to do it again this time with you, when he does it, he sees great miracles and he catches so many fish. But notice, Jesus is not teaching him how to catch fish. Jesus is teaching him how to catch men. So when Simon catches, he catches so much that they cannot fit in one. He has to ask for another ship. Brothers and sisters, I really need you to pay attention. You want the recall turned around. Firstly, you need to have Jesus in your life who will enable you to firstly study the Word of God and share the Word of God. So number one, you need Jesus in you. He draws you to the study of the Word, to the sharing of the Word. When you do so, and if you learn to obey the commands of Jesus, you are going to see a great work like this. Now listen to me. That ship is this immediate PYC people. Are you listening to me? See, the mother ship that we have here is the main PYC we have, we have just had earlier this year. That's the main mother ship. But we realize when God's people at the main mother ship obeyed God and they lifted up the word of God, when they did do that, one PYC was not enough. We are having the second PYC. Are you listening to me? One ship was not enough. There were two ships that one PYC not enough. Two are needed. And friends, today, if you give your life to the Lord, you start studying the word of God, you begin to obey God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you will realize this PYC will not be enough. You might have 10 or 15 PYCs. How many PYCs before you come attend the bigger PYC next year? That is, if these people turn their hearts and their lives completely to the Lord. And the thing is, it was just not enough. One after another, ships were sinking. They ran out of ships, but they did not run out of fish. Do you know there are more than enough people? in Biko to fill this whole campus up and you will not have this enough campus. You're planning to do it at all of you? 
If these people obey the Lord and move forward with the word of God in faith and submission, you have to change that next venue also because it will not be able to accommodate the number of people that will enter if you spend time in His word and obey His commands completely. Ships were sinking, nets were breaking and God's people obeyed. Friends, we need the word of God. We need to share the word of God. We need to obey the commands of Jesus. Number three, look at verse eight, Luke five and verse eight. Luke chapter five and verse eight, the Bible says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Simon knew in his heart, he said, ah, I don't know if we're going to catch much fish. I've been fishing all night. I'm an expert at doing this. And when he obeyed the words of Jesus, he caught so much fish. He, had, he did not even have enough ships to put in all the fish. That's how heavy it was. But when you really pay attention, he begins to go on his knees. That's the best part of the story. Verse 8 says, He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me. I am a sinful man. O oh Lord, brothers and sisters, those who have dropped on their knees, they are the ones who have truly experienced Christ-likeness. And the third quality you need as people who want to go out and bring people to the Lord, you have to be a people who go on your knees and humble yourselves. There is a lot of unbelief in our heart. I don't think this is possible. I don't think this can really happen. I don't think that will work. I don't think we have enough money. I don't think we have enough people. And we keep asking all these questions and don't press forward with the Lord. Jesus had to break all of that pride that Simon had. For Simon to be able to see with his own eyes that when we obey God, we see serious miracles happening. So he dropped on his knees and he asked the Lord, Lord, please depart from me. I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. Friends, if you really want to see some serious miracles at Biko, you will have to learn to go on your knees and seek the Lord with all your heart. Humble yourself before the Lord. I do not know how much more to emphasize this. In the ministry of God, there is no place for pride. There is absolutely no place for pride. Nobody can stand up here and say, hey, I want to preach a better sermon than the other guy. Nobody can stand up here and say, hey, I want to sing better than that other girl or that other guy. I want to play the guitar better than that guy or that other person. There is no place for pride in the ministry of God. You want to see serious work, then you have to seriously go on your knees and humble yourself before the Lord friends to be able to see a powerful work. There is a story I read that has really been shaking me these past few days. It has been really challenging in helping me to see how much I lack my time with the Lord. If you remember the great early Reformation movement, there was a reformer by the name John Wesley. Have you heard of him? John Wesley is a great reformer and known for how he caused reformation. John Wesley, I was just reading this story in an amazing book written by Sister Melody Mason. She accounts a story. John Wesley was one day allowed by the government of England to have a meeting with Lord Byron. He was allowed to have a meeting with Lord Byron and listen to the story, it's a very powerful story. He's allowed to have an audience with Lord Byron and here is John Wesley given the privilege to have a whole evening with Lord Byron. Now Lord Byron is one of the most powerful men in England at that time. And people who want to see him, they have to seek an appointment from months to be able to just see him for a few hours. And here John Wesley is given the privilege to spend the whole evening with Lord Byron. 
Until the evening begins, and John Wesley is with him, and they're having a chat, and they're talking about things. They're talking about different things. And, and in the middle of the conversation, towards the, towards the evening period, John Wesley gets up from his chair, and he says, Sir, uh, you have to excuse me. And he begins to leave while Lord Byron was still trying to talk. And he says to John Wesley, are you sure you're going? Uh, yes, I, I'm leaving. He says, but well, wait, the, the, the evening is still young and you're leaving already? He says, don't you know how many people are anxious and they stand in line and they seek appointments to just come and talk to me? To just spend time with me? And here I am giving you my own evening and you're saying you have to go? John Wesley looks in the face of Lord Byron and says, Sir, I don't mean to offend you in any way. And it has been my highest honor to have spent this evening with you. And I've had a great time having this evening with you. But sir, at this very moment, I have an appointment with the King of the Universe. And I dare not be late. And I dare not be tired when I go to talk to the King of the Universe walked out of the presence of the most powerful man in the world. I ask you as I ask myself, how much importance do you place on your personal time with God? Do you leave it for the late hours so that when you come to bed, you have no energy to study his word or to talk to him? Are you still listening? But we want to see a revival here, yeah? And we think that by coming to an event like this, oh, now we have revival. Friends, friends, don't fool yourselves. YCs like this, youth conferences like this, they become parties for many people. They come, have fun, enjoy the spiritual experience. They go home, same people. You want to see a true, genuine revival. Uh, Sister White tells us the true spirit of reformation will be evidenced by a true spirit of prayer. You have to be able to seek that personal time with God. And friends, you cannot allow anybody to challenge your time with God. And friends, like John Wesley, you ought to be able to say, it's now my time to spend time with the Lord. I dare not be late and I dare not be tired when I'm talking to God in prayer. Friends, we have to go on our knees, pick up and ask the Lord to enter your hearts, to enable you to walk with Him. Then pick up the word of God and seek him deeper and deeper into the pages. Then go out and obey what God is asking you to obey. Listen to me carefully. Like Simon, he might ask you to do something that might make no sense to you. But he doesn't have to make sense. You need to just obey him. The God who is asking you to do it, he's the one who created sense. So don't try to teach him sense. When he says go, friends, we need to learn to go. I'll share a very quick experience with you. I had given a prior appointment to a group of friends and I said, I will be at your church this Sabbath. We're going to have a prayer marathon. And they said, oh, brother Lord, we're looking forward to you coming. We're, we're looking forward to having that time with the Lord in prayer. And about a week before, I get a call. And the call is from the secretary at NPUC. And they said, Brother Ron, we'd like you to be speaker for NPUC Wide Young Professionals Retreat. And they tell me it's going to be in Koron, Palawan. Have you heard of that place? I mean, if you just see pictures of that place, you'll be quite amazed. It's a beautiful place. So we want you to come. We'll pay for your fare. We'll pay for your expenses. We'll keep you there. We just want you to come and speak. And here I am. I'm like, I'm thinking, wow, Koron is a beautiful place be a great place to go and visit. Great place to go and spend time in ministry. But something in my heart says, you've given a prior appointment and you have to stick there. And somebody's saying, hey, but that's a bigger event. You would have gone to that greater event. But my heart is saying, no, you have made a commitment and you have to be there. So I say, no, I'm sorry. I know it's a big event, but I'm sorry. I have to take up this prior appointment that I made. 
When I went to this prayer marathon, that night itself, the Lord showed me why He wanted me to be there and not go to court. At first, it didn't make sense. Lord, it's a greater event. It's a beautiful place. It'll be nice if we go there. More people will be ministered to. But the Lord's mind and voice was clear. You have to be here this night. Because what happened that night changed many lives. Many hearts. And I, I saw the Lord speaking to me that night. So this is why you thought I was not making sense. But this is why I wanted you to be here. Friends, when God asks you to do something, don't try to make sense out of it. You want to be successful in ministry, we have to learn to do what God asks us to do the way He asks us to do it. Let us go. Let us go to our last one. To our last one. We have learned. Can somebody tell me what is the first thing you have to do? Anyone? What is the first thing you have to do to be effective in this ministry? You have to allow who in your heart? Jesus. When you've done, what do you do next? You teach the Word of God. And you study the Word of God. What do you have to do next? Obey the commands of God. What do you do next? Go on your knees. Humble yourself. Pray to God. It equips you to be more effective in ministry. Lastly, if you have Luke chapter 5, read with me verse 10. Luke chapter 5, verse 10. James, John, sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth you will catch men. Verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. One more time. When they finally reached the shore, they forsook everything they had and they followed the Lord. You see, you understand in this country how big the fishing industry is. You know that, right? How much money people make out of selling fish because it sells a lot in this country. People eat a lot of fish. So fishing was a huge business, made a lot of money. When they came to the shore, none of them said, Lord, give us some time. We will sell the ship, we will use the money, and we will distribute tracts. We will buy t-shirts for PYC. Nobody said any of that. They brought their ships, they did not even collect the fish, they did not even sell the fish. When they got to the shore, they forsook everything. They put everything else aside and they followed the Lord with all their heart, mind and soul. Friends, that's what God is calling you to do today. After you've done everything, after you've heard everything, after you've learned every lesson, attended every breakout session, if you've not been willing to forsake all and follow Christ, we are going to be useless in the work of God. I want you to listen to me. Turn your Bibles. Turn your Bibles as you go with me to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, same, same book, Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, listen to this, listen to this, Luke 14 verse 33, so Jesus says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And that was my prayer, without realizing that I have to share this text with you this morning. That was my prayer this morning, Lord, we don't want PYC to be filled with attendees. We want PYC to be filled with disciples. Did you hear me? We want attendees or disciples? We want disciples, Lord. And Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple unless you forsake your all and follow me. You've learned many things about the Word of God. You've heard great presentations. You've attended great devotional exercises. You've heard great things about what to wear and how to study the Bible and how to grow in faith and how to relate to your parents and how to have deeper relationships. But after all of that, if you have not come and forsaken all, friends, one of our greatest diseases in the church is that we think we can live a two-faced life. 
I will be all holy when I come to church. I will be all worldly when I'm in the world. In the world. And God is saying to be able to be truly effective in the ministry, we have to learn to forsake all. Uh, an interesting verse jumped out at me yesterday. Uh, go, go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. And Pastor Henry was pointing this out and it really struck me. It really struck me as I, as I studied this passage. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. The Bible says, yes, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dumb. And we studied the word dumb. As Henry was really emphasizing that. He says it, it means left over. Stuff that we throw in the waste. Are you there? Stuff that we throw in the waste. Now, now notice this. Notice this. Notice this very carefully. He says I have suffered the loss of that which I now count as dumb. Waste. Left over. Things you're going to throw out. Now, now listen to me carefully. Are leftovers of any value to you? Are leftovers any value to you? You throw it away, right? So are they of any value to you? So when you leave leftovers, do you call that a loss? Do you call that a loss? No, it's waste. I'm going to throw it away anyways. So notice what God is really asking you to do as Paul emphasizes it. He says the things that God is asking you to leave out are leftover. They are done. They are useless. So what I'm taking away from you is really, you're not losing anything. In fact, I'm not asking you, listen carefully, I'm not asking you to give up anything that is going to be of value to your salvation. Brothers and sisters, if something has been lost in your life today, listen to me carefully. If something has been lost out of your life today, you see God's hand taking it away from you, that he is assuring you to let you know you didn't need it in the first place. And if you've lost things in life while serving the Lord, he is, that is your reminder that what you have lost, you do not need to grow closer to Jesus. So you need to learn to forsake all and ask the Lord to take away things that don't matter, that are of no value. Lord, take these things out, take the waste out, so that I can truly be able to appreciate who Jesus is and what he wants me to do in my life. Sister White shares an impressive comment in the book Education, page 296 and paragraph 5. The book Education, page 296, paragraph 5. Notice what she says. The exchange we make in the denial of selfish desires and inclinations. One more time. The exchange we make in the denial of selfish desires and inclinations is an exchange of the worthless and transitory for the precious and enduring. When we deny ourselves and ask the Lord, I want to walk in your footsteps, she says you are giving up that which is temporary to hold on to that which is precious and permanent. Did you catch that? When we ask the Lord and hold on to his hand, give up our selfish desires and hold on to that which God is offering, notice what she says. She says this is not called sacrifice. This is called infinite gain. Remember that? Many people like to remind God, Hey God, you know I gave up smoking. You have to bless me. As if you giving up smoking helps God's health. Lord, don't you know? I've given up that bad habit. Now you really have to bless me. That bad habit was destroying you or God. You are going to die in that bad habit or God. And we like to put these things in God's face. Lord, I've, I've stopped that. I don't do that. I don't go there. I don't eat that. I don't wear that. I'm not this and I'm not that. And God is saying, what you have given up, it's not called sacrifice. It is called eternal gain. You've given up the junk to receive treasure. I don't think that is called sacrifice. Howard, if I take all your clothes from you and give you a brand new suit, that's a loss. I take away the few coins you have in your pocket and I give you one million dollars. 
Oh, Brother Lord, you put me in such a great loss. This is not sacrifice. You're giving up junk to receive the everlasting life Jesus is offering. And he wants us to have this and he says, that, that is the infinity that I'm offering you, which I desire for you to take. I desire for you to take. And so yesterday, I said you read this beautiful passage in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Oh, Father, what was the message last night? Do you remember the title? Already and not yet. Do you remember it? Okay, okay. Pay attention as we go through it again. Philippians 3 and verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I do what I follow after, that I may apprehend, or in other words, I may attain that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He says, I have put everything aside. I put the past aside. I'm not thinking about what I've already attained. I'm looking forward to the not yet. I am pressing forward and I am following after the Lord. I am pursuing the Lord today. Are you there? Because as I pursue and I run and I chase, I want Jesus. That's what I am pursuing. I am not pursuing anything else. I am not pursuing blessings from Him. I am pursuing Him. So he says, it is Jesus that I am after. It is Jesus who I seek to attain. But pause and listen to me. He was running after, he was following after because he wanted Jesus in his life. And the question one begins to ask, what is this pushing after? What is this following after? One scholar puts it like this. The Hebrews, okay, the ancient Israel, are you with me? Ancient Israel were in pursuit of light. All that they talked about was the light. That's why there are many texts in the Old Testament, the Lord is my light and salvation. Have you heard that? The people of uh, light, they were called. The people that moved from darkness into light. The Hebrews were very conscious and they were in pursuit of light. And then came along the Greeks. And the Greeks were known for their knowledge. I mean, to this day, we, the world knows Greek philosophy and Greek scholars because of the, the in-depth studies they did and the knowledge they have imparted to the world. And the Greeks were always chasing knowledge, always chasing knowledge. The Hebrews were chasing what? Light. And the Greeks were pursuing what? Knowledge. And then came the Roman Empire. For Rome, they were in pursuit of glory. They wanted to see the glory of Rome, the majestic Colosseums, the great columns, the great pillars, the great... It was all about the glory of Rome, a city that was not built in a day. It was all about the glorious nature of Rome, the way they dressed, what they spoke, what they ate. It was about glory for them. Let's repeat that again. Israel, Hebrews, they were pursuing what? Light. What were the Greeks pursuing? Knowledge. And what were the Romans pursuing? Interesting. Interesting. Paul, who was a Hebrew by birth. Are you there? Paul, who was a Hebrew by birth, was a Roman citizen living in a Greek city. Are you there? Let me check if I have that right. Paul, who was a Hebrew by birth, who was a citizen of Rome, and was living in a Greek city. Paul had something to say to these three groups of people. What were they pursuing? Light, knowledge, and... Turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. As he writes these words, a man who is Hebrew by birth, Roman by citizenship, and living in a Greek city, notice the words of Paul, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, are you there? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. So the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, 
He is the one who shines in our hearts. And I told you today, Jesus wants to enter your heart. Do you know why? He continues to say, because it is he who gives the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Hebrews chasing light, the Greeks chasing knowledge, the Romans chasing glory. Paul says you're chasing all these things, three things separately. I found all of them in one person and that is Jesus. My question this afternoon is what are you pursuing this afternoon? What are you after? What is your pursuit? Higher grades, more money, more clothes, more food, more desires, more sinful appetite. What are you after today? What are you following after? Paul says, I'm following after, I'm running, I'm chasing, I'm pursuing, I'm pursuing Christ because that's who I need in my life. I found the light, knowledge, glory, power, fame. I found the things I need. I found peace. I found what it means to be enamored. And he asks us all the question as I present that question to you that where do you find yourself today in the experience of the losing and gaining? Stuff that you call loss is actually gain to God. And stuff that you call gain are actually losses in the eyes of God. And He wants to change all of that for us as you learn to look into the face of Christ and begin to understand that my experience with the Lord is teaching me to forsake all things, forsake every experience, forsake habits and desires, and to learn to pursue Jesus with all my heart and with all my mind. I want to end with a simple story. Many years ago when America had entered into war with Vietnam, they had entered this war scenario and Vietnam was a communist country. One evangelist tells his experience of the time when he ministered to the people of Vietnam. He says, as we went there, they took us on a motorcycle from one place to another. It was a communist country and Christians in America, many of them were desirous to share Jesus in this country. And so one of these evangelists, he shares his story, he says, we got there and they put us on a motorcycle and they took us, uh, the, the, the people took us from one village to another as we went preaching Jesus from one place to another. Listen to the story very carefully as I draw this to an end. He says, we went from here, we went there, we went there, we went there, trying to preach Jesus. He says, but I could not speak the Vietnamese language. So there was a young man whose name was Hien. What's the name? Hien was a young man who joined this revivalist joined this evangelist. He said, Pastor, I will join with you and I will translate whatever you share. And so he and, and this evangelist, they go out and they keep moving from one village to another, sharing Jesus. And at every message, he and knows nothing about Christ, but now he is preaching Christ. Are you following? He who knows nothing about Christ now has to preach Christ as he translates the words of this American evangelist. As he does this night after night after night, he and cannot believe the love of God and the power of God that he is explaining to the people. Eventually, he and himself gives his life to the Lord. He and himself, a communist, becomes a Christian. And as he gives his life to the Lord wholeheartedly, it's time for the American evangelist to leave. Because America was now retracing their presence or they're taking away their presence from Vietnam. And so this American evangelist has to go away with, with, with other people who had come to minister. And so as they move out, Hien finds himself alone. Trying to reach out, trying to tell others about you, but he finds himself a little alone, but he's pressing on to tell people about the Lord. The government finds out that this young man Hien was associating with the Americans and they began to accuse him of plotting the downfall of the Vietnamese race. So they accuse him of national crime and in the name of national security they take Hien and they put him in prison. Are you still there? 
They take him in. They put him in prison. And when he is put in prison, his heart is broken. He says, Lord, what is this? I was seeking to serve you. I loved you. My journey has begun. And you put me in prison for serving you? And there he is, he had in his brokenness, in his nothingness, doesn't know what he can do and how he can fix his situation. And then one day he gets up in the morning, he says, I've had enough. God, I am not going to pray to you again. I've had enough of you. If you loved me, you would not have put me in this situation. If you loved me, you would not have put me in this situation. I do not want to talk to you, God. I will never pray again to you. He he put away his bed and he walked away. Of course, there were no Bibles allowed in that place. It was a communist prison. So he puts his stuff away. He gets up for his bed. I'm not going to talk to you, God, ever again. You don't love me. You don't take care of me. He then goes out. And that day, the prison guard in charge, he says, He and today you are going to clean the CR. And he and is filled with anger. And he's thinking, you don't love me, put me in prison, and of all the work you could have given me, you're asking me, Lord, now to go and clean the prison? See, Lord, do you know how bad it smells and how dirty it is? He then gets up, enters the CR, and it smells bad, and it's filthy, and it's dirty. There's a trash can that is overflowing. He is so angry as he begins to clean up that CR. He cleans up, waters it, washes things away, and as he gets ready to empty the trash can, he picks up the trash can and he empties it outside. As he empties it outside, in the midst of all the toilet papers and all the other garbage and trash, he finds one particular paper that stands out. It is crumpled. It has, it is, it has been crumpled and it has human feces on it. Are you listening? This is a true story. He had, who has just given his life to the Lord is angry, not going to talk to you. Put his duty in the CR. He is throwing out trash. Finds one paper that has human feces on it. But what does he and do? He picks up that paper. Holds it with his bare hands. I believe the story goes. He comes, opens the faucet. And with his hands, he is cleaning the paper off of human feces. Are you still there? Opens the faucet. Cleans with his hands the human feces. As he cleans that paper, he quietly puts it in his pocket takes it to his room in the dark of the night under a moonlight where nobody could be able to see at his bed. He breaks open that crumpled paper and before him is lying a page from the Bible. He's amazed to find the page of a Bible in a trash can with human feces on it. He wipes it off that morning. That night he opens that page and he's reading Romans chapter 8. He's reading Romans chapter 8. Do you want to read that with me? you want to read what he had read? Go to Romans chapter 8. He had opened that page that day and... He found Romans 8. As he began to look, he began to read Romans 8. And it was quite interesting as he began to read. And he read some interesting things. And he read some powerful things. And he began to realize, okay, this and that. But he is still confused and still angry with the Lord. He had reached down and he's starting from verse 1. He tries to make his way down, still angry with the Lord, reading the Bible, but he's beginning to figure out what God really has in mind for him. As he had reached down the verses, he comes to Romans 8 and verse 28. He reached down and reads on that crumpled paper, Romans 8 verse 28. We know that all things work together for who? For good, for them that love God and are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good, for me. And he begins to read, he says, all the things will happen to them according to His purpose, not according to their purpose. He is there and he was battling with himself, angry with God. And God spoke to him through Romans 8. And he's reading that and he's saying, wait a second. Are you telling me 
this is your plan of love, God? This is your plan of love? You love me so much that you throw me in prison, mistreat me, and ask me to clean CR's cough. This is not a good plan. How is this working out for my good? Cleaning CR's is for my good. And he reached down Romans 8, with, still with anger, until he gets to Romans 8 and towards the end. He is complaining, God, I've been separated from my family. I've been separated from home. I've been separated from my Bible to spend time with you. You're saying this is happening for my good. When he begins to read Romans 8.38, his mind is blown as he reads Romans 8.38. For I am persuaded, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When he reads those words and he realizes that God says to him, nothing can separate you from me, my son. Tears fall down Pian's cheeks as he goes on his knees, talks to the Lord and gives and consecrates his life back to the Lord. He says, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I judged you. Lord, I'm sorry I was too quick to anger. Lord, I'm sorry I did not realize your perfect plan for me. He had woke up the next morning, went to the prison guard and said, Sir, can I clean the CR today? Clean the CR? Yes, can I clean the CR today? Sure, no one else really likes to do it. He then goes quickly in the rush as he cleans the seer and when it's time for emptying the trash can, he picks up the trash can, throws it out. As he empties, he finds another paper that is crumpled. Picks up that paper, washes it with human feces with his bare hands. He washes the page of a Bible, puts it in his pocket, brings back home and that night he reads another page from the Bible. Goes in the next day, sir, can I clean the CR? Again goes to the trash can, another paper crumpled with human feces, wipes it with his bare hands, brings it and night after night after night, somebody's putting human feces and somebody's having devotionals every night. <laughs> after many years, he and his release from prison and he finds out that the prison manager the prison manager, a strict and a staunch communist, hated God so much that he had on his desk a Bible. And every day when he had to go to the CR, instead of using a toilet paper, he would tear a page from the Bible and use that to wipe his heart. And while he was busy, while he was busy disrespecting the word of God, there was somebody else wiping off human feces with his hands just so that he could have a Bible study with Jesus. This is in a communist nation. I want you to be very silent and listen to me very carefully as I close. This is in a communist nation where people did not even believe in God. And I stand here in a Christian dominant nation. One of the only countries left in the world that are Christian dominated. What importance does God have in your life today? A young man had to wipe human feces with his hands to have a Bible study. And we have tablets and phones that are Bibles. We have Bibles, leather bounded, hard bounded, paper bounded, all kinds of materials. And we would not spend time in the study of God. We would not spend time with him. And he then teaches me that to forsake all and to work for God is not an easy task. Friends, I want to show you something in Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, listen to me carefully. In Philippians 3, 12, when Paul says, I am following after, I'm following after, I'm following after because I need to attain Christ. I'm following after. I sat there last night in the back as Pastor Henry was preaching. He says, Paul was following after, following after. That word struck me. The Spirit said, look up what that word means. I looked up what the word following after means in the Greek. It means to pursue. It means to chase. It means to pursue with all your strength. But I realized that the same word is translated in other verses. In fact, in Philippians 3, 6, 
Paul says, I was persecuting with zeal, and the word persecuting is the same Greek word as following after. Friends, to follow after Christ, to come after Christ is not a bed of roses. To come after Christ means you have to be ready to be persecuted. To follow after Christ when you have forsaken all, when you've put everything else out, when God is top priority, not even friends or the world or the things in the world, when you spend time in God's word and give your heart to the Lord, seeking only to win soul after soul after soul, I tell you from experience, the devil will attack you. You will have to go through experiences of persecution, but if you remember the three Hebrew boys in the furnace, the furnace was hot, it was flaming. People who threw them in the furnace, they burned, but the boys in the furnace did not get burned because that day Jesus was with them in the furnace. When they were being mocked and questioned, Jesus did not appear. When they were being thrown aside, Jesus did not appear. When they were tied up, Jesus did not appear. When they were brought near the flames, he did not appear. When they got in the furnace, Jesus was clearly seen, brothers and sisters, when you embrace the Lord. You follow after, get ready for persecution. The promise of the Lord is that in every furnace of your life, there will be a Jesus standing next to you. As you work for him, you will be attacked. But there is a deliverer who knows how to save you and to deliver you. Friends, I want you to know that the Lord wants us to get serious with this mission. He wants you to get serious in the study of his word going on our knees and seeking Him and telling the world about Him. But don't you dare ever think that this is easy business. So I let you know beforehand, it is going to be a tough and challenging work. Which is why the Lord is not looking for attendees, He's looking for disciples. And He promises, He says, if you stay faithful unto death, in the book of Revelation, He says, those who are faithful unto death, they will receive the hard life. And the Lord has prepared much more than the Bible says what eyes have seen and ears have heard. And He's just waiting to bestow all of that upon you. I want to end the YC people then by asking all of you to close your eyes and bow your heads. With every head bowed and with every eye closed. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. I know, I understand, I have seen with my own eyes how you have struggled these past few days. I see that there are areas where you are still struggling because your past life calls you to be there. It calls you to spend more time there. Somebody is being whispered by the devil right now, this is too much holiness, don't do this. Get ready, now when this finishes, this is the night you go home and enjoy, don't think of anything else. You've heard a lot of serious messages, now go enjoy, watch TV, relax for yourself. Don't get too serious, it's not good. My friends, I tell you this from experience at many YCs and youth meetings like this. Tonight after you leave is when the real work begins. Tonight when you leave is when the world will become more pleasurable to you than ever before. Tonight those temptations will come to you like you've never imagined. Tonight you'll be drawn to the world. The coming days you will be attacked and drawn to the world because the devil is not happy to see you give your life to the Lord. And Paul said to Timothy, let none despise thy youth. Some of you are young, school, high school, college, and you're beginning to realize I'm young and I want to give my life to the Lord. My friends, the promise to the three Hebrew boys is a promise that has not changed. It's a promise that's going to stay with you. 
Some of you are going to go back home to friends in school or at home or neighbors. The Lord is expecting you to represent Him correctly when you go home. And so I plead with you, whatever you want to leave, leave it back in these campgrounds. Don't take that home with you. The Lord is expecting each and every son and daughter here to go home a changed person. Resources abound. The Word of God is before you. You have a wealth of resource just from this weekend. You have a wealth of resource just from this weekend. And we're going to try and talk and we're going to make sure every presentation you have missed is all recorded. You have videos. You want notes and PowerPoint slides for every presentation. That will be given as well. Friends, nothing will be held back from you. You need the things that are required to grow, to learn. You want to grow in this experience. The Lord has promised He will give, He will supply. But He's looking for a people that are serious. Maybe you don't know how to do this. Maybe you don't know how to study the Word. You don't know how to share the Word. He's only expecting you to come spend time with Him. He will take care of you. There will be training sessions in the future. There will be equipping seminars. The Lord is preparing the way, but He's looking for serious disciples. The Lord is not interested in people who have come here for a fleeting experience to go back home to their own life. He is looking for individuals who are willing to commit their heart, mind, and body to the Lord. And so I plead with you, young brothers and sisters, is there anything that is still pressing upon your heart at this moment? Is there still something that is clouding your mind and not allowing you to see Jesus? Is there still some habit, some temptation, some sin that is still blocking your way to the Lord? We're going to spend about a minute in prayer. In complete silence, will you please, I beg you, talk to the Lord and surrender whatever that is. Whatever you are battling with, you're thinking, maybe when I go home I'll do it. Maybe later I will do it. Whatever it is, would you like to keep that aside right now? And give your life wholeheartedly and tell the Lord, Lord, my life is yours. You have spoken to me in love. You have revealed to me so much of yourself. I do not want to be the same person again. Please, help me to be the man, the woman you want me to be. Plead for his strength. Invite Jesus into your life today. And he has promised when he is in you, he will enable you to keep the commandments. He will enable you to be strong. Enable you to have the spiritual strength and backbone. Whatever it is, friends, will you please talk to him right now and surrender that to him. This is an extreme moment of seriousness. If you are distracted by anyone, I'll suggest you to move away from their chair right now. If your neighbor is distracting you, you've been distracted by anything, just move away. I beg with you to spend this time only with God, nothing else. In a moment of silence, will you please talk to him and ask him to give you the courage, the boldness, and the overcoming power. Will you claim his hand and his victory in your life as you spend this time in prayer before I make the next appeal? So in my first appeal, will you just talk to the Lord and ask him for victory as you seek to forsake whatever it is that's blocking your way. Please, please talk to the Lord right now.
church to heal. And this is a serious one. We've talked about how important it is to forsake. My friends, Christian life is described, true Christian life is described by separation. Separation from the world and unity with Christ. True enamoring can only happen when you are filled with the amour who is God. And if you want to go home enamored, truly enamored, not by anything, but by amour himself, which is God. If you want to go home filled with God and filled with God and God alone, that means there is no space for anything else in your life. That means there's no space for anything else in your life. And so I ask you at this very moment, is there anything in your life at this moment that is taking up the space that God is supposed to take? You have to separate yourself from it at this very moment. I'm going to make a very practical and a very personal appeal. Your hearts are surrendered to the Lord as you do this, as you've pleaded with your courage. And now you're going to signify it by a physical experience. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, nobody has to watch anybody. This is not entertainment. You have your cell phones, you have your laptops, you have your tablets. I want to sincerely ask you, is there still anything there that is connecting you to the world? Is there still anything there, any image, any song, any movie clip, anything that is there that is still connecting you to the world? You truly want to experience Jesus? You will have to disconnect yourself from it right now. Is there a number of somebody that should not be there? Is there a text from someone that should not be there? I want to plead with you, will you beg with God to give you the courage to delete that at this very moment? I'm not going to wait to go back to your tent or go home and do that. You're seated right here, you either have cell phones or tablets or laptops, whatever it is. You want to go to your tent, to your laptop and do it, I will allow you to do it. But if we want a close communion with the Lord, if there is anything upon you. That's why nobody has to watch anyone. All eyes are closed. If you realize that there is still something, you've heard these messages, you've heard the power of music and the power of these games and things that are disconnecting you from God, will you tell the Lord, Lord, I will disconnect myself from that which disconnects me from you? Is there anything, friends? Is there anything you'd like to delete right now? You have things in your hand. You have your cell phones. You have your tablets. You want to go to your tent to get your laptops. You can do that. But you want to take out that which will not allow you to grow in Christ. Would you like to delete it right now? Somebody's number that should not be there. That person is becoming a hindrance. It's not allowing you to see Christ. You want to delete that connection. Some song playing somewhere. You're saving, and I know you can download all these things again. Would you beg with God to give you the courage and to proclaim by what you do and who you are, by what you wear and what you listen to, that God, I belong to you, and nothing upon me, nothing inside me will tell the world that I belong to somebody else. So I ask you, do you want to plead with the Lord to give you the courage to delete right now whatever is not godly, whatever is not Christ-like? And don't worry about who's around you. Nobody has to watch you. Every eye is closed. And every head is bowed. It's you and your God. Friends, if you start getting worried about somebody's watching, somebody's looking, nobody seated here can offer you salvation. Nobody seated here loves you the way God loves you. If he had the courage to be naked on a cross to save you from your sins, 
Will you not take the courage to take that trash out of your life and draw close to God right now? Heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. I'll give you time. I'll give you time. I praise God. I praise God for those who are doing it. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Please. 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 Do not reject the Spirit. Do not reject. Do not throw away what he's asking you to do at this moment, please. Would you like to take that out? Would you like to delete it? Throw it away. Beg with God to not allow you to go back. To block your way in going back. To change the desires you have in your heart. You want to separate yourself from that which is leading you astray because you want to stay close to God. You want to truly be able to sing that hymn, nothing between my soul and my Savior. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. We'll give you time. This is Holy Spirit time. This is not our time. We'll give you time. However much time you need to go ahead and work on that thing, please go ahead and do it. For those of you who have already done that, after you've listened to all the presentations and the devotions, you've already done that, I ask you to pray right now. I ask you to pray right now to God. Because if you stand right now, you are the highest, highest target of the devil. Because he wants to attack you, to take you back from where you have come. You want to pray to God right now, Lord, keep me, secure me, fill me that I do not go back. Hold me that I may not go back. Pray for those of your friends who are struggling with the same thing. That through your example, they may be led to Christ. That they may see in you that there is a greater love than that which is in this world. There is a greater love that exists that is not found in the stuff of this world. You want to show them that, not tell them that. You want to show them that by your own life. By the choice of dresses you will make after this conference. By the choice of words you will use after this. By the choice of actions and the choice of your behavior. You want to show them, not tell them, that this is Jesus in me. This is Jesus in me. Nobody has to look at anyone. You don't have to consult anybody right now. This is you and God. You know what's filthy in there. You know what's dirty in there. You know what is not Christ-like. I praise God for giving some of you the strength to do it. I praise Him for giving you the strength to do it. We'll give you time. We'll give you time as the Spirit impresses you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you've already done it, plead, plead, friends, plead with the Lord. Plead with the Lord. Sister White says, whenever you neglect prayer, that's when the devil surrounds you. Whenever you neglect prayer, that's when he will surround you with a cloud of darkness. So if you've only given that stuff up this week, please keep talking to him right now. Keep talking to him right now to keep me here, Lord. Don't let me go back. Keep me here, Lord. I don't want to go away from your presence. Keep me with you. Keep me with you. Maybe there's someone seated here who is reminded of the junk that lies in your bedroom when you go. Maybe in your living room as you go. Maybe it's a collection of songs. Maybe it's a collection of movies. Maybe it's DVDs or CDs. You know are not drawing you close to them. You know are not drawing you close to God. 
you want to pray right now, Lord, the first thing I do when I get home, I will throw them out. Or the first thing I want to do is, when I get home, I want to separate myself from these things. Give me the courage and the boldness and the firmness to do that which is right. Lord, help me. Help me separate. Help me separate from that which is not Christ-like. Is there anybody here who would like to admit that, Lord, I've been failing, I've been struggling, I've been falling a lot. And I thank you for who I see, I thank you for appealing to my heart, I thank you for calling me home, and I thank you for embracing me as if I've not done anything. Thank you for that love, Lord. Love that's unconditional. Love that's unbounded. Love that has no end. I want to thank you for that love, Lord. And I want to respond by giving my life to you completely. By allowing you to have charge over my life. By allowing you to win in my life. By giving you, Lord, the power to decide what I will do. What I will wear. What I will eat. Who I will be. Lord, I want to surrender that charge over to you. If that is you, would you like to come to the front? Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Again, nobody has to watch anybody. If that is you and you desire, you want your life committed to the Lord, would you just get up from where you are and come to the front? This is not for the preacher. You want to signify by a physical movement. Lord, I want to move away from where I am. I want to move away from my old life. I want to move away from my past experiences. I want to follow after the Lord. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. You're seeking Jesus. Will you just come to the front? Wherever you may be, wherever you may be seated. You want Jesus. You want your heart and your life to be one and used only by Him. If that is you, would you like to come to the front as we pray together? Wherever you may be, however you may be, you don't have to come because friends are coming. You don't have to come to please anybody, not even the speaker, not the presenters, not your leaders. You don't have to please anyone. If you're coming to the front, you're coming because you want the Lord in your life. You want the Lord in your life. You want the Lord in your life. You want to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm going to start pursuing right now. As Paul says, I'm going to pursue you, not for blessings, not for gifts, not for power. I want to pursue you because I want you in my life. I want you in my heart. I want you having the victory. That's why you come to the front. That's the only reason you come to the front. As you give your heart and life to the Lord, I want to request PYC officers, I want to request PYC officers, if you can surround all these people. PYC officers, and I request you to surround PYC, the main PYC, not PYC people. Can I request the main PYC officers to stand around these people, wherever you may be? Wherever you may be, can you please come just stand around these people as we surrender them, dedicate them, consecrate them to the Lord? to be used only by God. Every talent here. You can speak, you can smile, you can sing, you can clean up a place. You will use every talent to the glory of God. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. We're all going to need as we submit our heart and our life to the Lord to be fully and completely used by Him. Your heads are bowed, I will go through you, please humbly kneel. You will humbly just kneel and we all pray together and ask the Lord to give us the strength which we do not have, which only comes from Him, that will enable us to be with the Lord and stay with the Lord. Stay with the Lord. Friends, in John 15, Jesus says, Abide in me. 
Don't just visit me and go away. Stay with me. Linger with me. Stay with him a little bit longer. Spend more time with him. Don't just visit him. Don't just come and go. Don't just let him in and throw him out the next week. Stay with the Lord, please. Stay with the Lord. It will get sweeter as the days go by. It will get brighter as the years pass by. It will get glorious as the ages go. Stay with the Lord, my friends. Stay in prayer. We have no hope in you too. Please, stay in prayer. Then. Don't stop talking to the Lord. Whether you've fallen, whether you've made a mistake, whether you've gone back, always come back and talk to the Lord. Don't quit talking to Him. Don't let the devil get into your head and keep you from praying for whatever reason. Keep talking to the Lord. Keep talking to the Lord. Keep talking to the Lord in peace. If you're kneeling before the Lord and you want your life, if you're so fully committed to the Lord. I'm going to start with a prayer. After I finish praying, I will request our president of the PYC. With Nobel Pablo to end with a final prayer. I will begin with one prayer. He will give a final prayer as we submit and surrender our full selves to be used by our friends. I want you to start praying very seriously. I want you to start praying, the Lord, show me what talent it is you've given me. And how would you like me to use it? How can I use this to bring somebody to Christ? Ask specific specific prayers. Make your prayers pointed and specific. Don't generalize. Lord, I want to be used. No. Ask him, Lord, how should I be used? I have this. I have this talent. I have that. Lord, how would you like me to use this for your glory? Make it specific and ask him to lead you in the direction if he wants you to go. Please. And don't stop praying. Listen to me carefully. Don't stop praying until you hear him tell you what to do. Do not stop praying until his will is clear and discerned in your life. Stay in prayer. I assure you, you will never be lost. You will never be lost in your life. So let us all pray as we, as we come together in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, what a glorious experience we have had. Thank you for taking over our plans and our desires. I thank you that in spite of our brokenness, our wretchedness, Lord, you have done a work that is beyond us. Father, forgive us for the many years wasted in pride and vanity and jealousy and envy. It has hindered the work of God. For this that happened ages ago. We ask for forgiveness for delaying and becoming an obstacle in you. Lord, I give you glory for PYC people. I praise you. You have done a mighty work in this place. Lord, I submit to you all of these young hearts and minds, their parents, their loved ones, Lord, as they come to you. Please, mighty God. Do not cast us out as we claim that promise. Please continue to work with us. Show us our need of the Holy Spirit. Bend us before you so that we will remain unbended to the world. Keep us bowed before Jesus so that we may not bow to anything else in this world. May these knees they may only kneel before the Lord so that they don't kneel before anything else in the world. Father, please, I present these lives before you. They have had to make some serious decisions and I praise you, your Holy Spirit in them has helped them to make that decision. Lord, the life ahead is going to be filled with many attacks for the devil is not happy to see them come to Jesus. But I believe that the Jesus in them that they have invited today will be strong in them and keep them erect and firm in these last days. Father, please, keep them in prayer, Lord. Lord, we fail because we stop talking to you. 
We fail because we don't spend time with you. We fail because we take you for granted. Forgive us for you. And keep us with you. Keep us with you. Keep us with you. I surrender this PYC equal experience as it comes to a close this evening. I plead that the real work may now begin in these lives. And they go home as vessels filled with Jesus and emptied of the world. And they go home and throw away everything in their lives.